It is so exciting to be here, and what an amazing show. <laughs> I wish I had all that talent. <laughs> um, but I'm, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, some of you might know me as Rupa, um, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Rupa Dot. Uh, I am the executive director and co-founder of Women in Global Health. Um, Yes, yes. <laughs> if you can't read my shirt, that's what it says. Um, but my little secret up here is that I did not wake up like this. Um, but I promise to really keep, um, keep it real today, have an honest conversation with, with all of you, um, really a conversation about power, privilege, barriers, and hopefully some learnings, lessons along the way. So first, who am I? I'm a dreamer. I call myself a dreamer, um, probably like many of you in this room, when I first uh, heard, watched Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, I knew, I was touched, that my whole life I would be working to address social injustices. But more than that, my story really begins as a dreamer. I'm an immigrant, my parents are immigrants, uh, we came to the United States with lots of dreams, and I grew up just dreaming, like all sorts of stuff. Some things that really make me laugh, um, some Indian American, and so it meant that, you know, while some people had imaginary friends, I had imaginary boyfriends. <laughs> Teddy being the first. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> um, and some of my dreams, uh, they make me tear up, unrealized ones the ones about barriers, um, the ones that I really didn't know how to overcome my barriers. Uh, but along the way, I started realizing I'm gonna dream about the possibilities. And I'm super, super fortunate. Um, dreaming about possibilities changed my reality. Uh, I'm standing here today um, as the first woman in my family to be a physician. So. <laughs> don't celebrate that as much as I should, and thank you. Um, I also got to choose my life partner, uh, and none of the women before me have had the chance to do that, and I'm really lucky. He's, he's great. <laughs> um, and, and this one, I get to choose to be financially dependent. So that's a great choice. <laughs> Uh, but these are my powers, my privileges, and my choices that I've made. I also call myself a warrior. Yep, a warrior. Don't, don't get scared. I'm the kind of warrior you want on your team, okay? <laughs> um, my, my ancestors, the Sikhs of uh, northern India, um, emerged during a time where there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of um, just just a lot of tension, um, particularly religious tension, ethnic tensions, persecutions. Um, I like to think of them, warriors, men and women alike, uh, warriors of values. They wanted to create a society with more tolerance, be lifelong learners, greater equity. Um, and like my ancestors, I find myself in a time where, gosh, there's just so much inequity. Um, you know, I thought the world would be different when I got to this age. And I look around and, you know, people joke around about how millions are chump change. Um, and investor ta investors talk in trillions. But half of the world's population still does not have access to basic quality health care. And I could go on and on. Um, but these injustices, they really spark my inner warrior, and I'm sure all of your inner warriors are sparked as a result too, and committed to really, um, committed really to social justice in my lifetime. Oh. And then, I'm quite sure, and I'm convinced that all of us have some sort of inner animal, spirit, um, mine is the lioness. A lioness is brave, a powerful creature, um, but most of all, she's smart. Uh, she's smart because she's realized the power of community. 
She works with other lionesses um, for her cubs, for the cubs of other lionesses, to really invest in the next generation. And so, I'm a dreamer, a warrior, a lioness, and through that, I have all these different powers and privileges. These powers and privileges, they shape who I am. And I wanted to just take a moment to share those with you because they're very linked to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, I stand here before you today not as that I woke up, this, woke up like this flawless Linus, um, but really, really one that questions, that doubts. Uh, faces struggles, you know, the, those really tough moments, um, the conversations we don't get to have enough, the untold um, barriers um, that we face that make us question who we are, what we're doing. Um, here to share that story. So, what's my passion? Women in global health. Um, you know, I woke up and I was thinking about why is this my particular passion? And it's not just about gender equality, but it's about my personal life journey and the journey of half of this world's population not reaching their maximum potential. I really, really believe that we can't get far if we don't tap into all of it, and women are part of that, and that's why I'm committed to gender equality. And I'm super fortunate that I found like-minded early career women. Um, these are my co-founders, uh, and they're, they're all really amazing. Um, they were asking similar questions like, how is it possible in a field like global health that has so many talented women that we don't see them in the top levels of leadership? And we started asking, you know, what can we do about it? So first, we started digging, and it didn't take us long to realize the leadership gap in global health, particularly on gender. 70% of the health workforce are women. That's nearly three quarters. But when you look at top leadership, especially in academia, policymakers, private sector, the numbers dwindle quite quickly, 25%. And if you start looking even deeper into the issue, it's pervasive. Women are undervalued. Half of their contributions are unpaid. They're under-recognized. Awards in medicine and public health cap at 10%, even though women in this country have been receiving higher education for nearly three decades. They're often unpaid, unpaid, underprotected, underinvested in. Um, and I could go on. And on, yeah, take this one in. Those, those, that photo right there, that's our global health world leaders right there, the bank and uh, the World Health Organization. I could talk to you about all the barriers, but I'm pretty sure I'm talking to a convinced audience already. The bottom line, gender equality matters. It's the right thing to do. Women's rights, human rights. It makes sense, literally sense, smart economics. Um, data has shown us that if we achieve gender parity in the workforce, we would reach 28 trillion um, growth to our GDP worldwide. We also know that diversity results in more sustainable solutions. So with my co-founders, we were inspired. We, we were like, we got to do something. We got to act now, and not just act in a small way, but in a global way, just how large this issue is. So we thought, you know, we, ha we have the right ingredients, right? We had a vision, a good cause, and the data to back it up, committed team, and supporters from all walks of life. So we launched the Women in Global Health movement. But as we know, success is rarely linear. Along the way, we've faced challenges, barriers. I'd say we're still facing them. It's a daily reality. But we've learned lessons along the way. Lesson number one, 
Early success and exposure creates a misperception of organizational capacity. I'm gonna repeat that one. Early success, which we all really love, right? Early success and exposure creates a misperception of organizational capacity. Women in global health resonated with the world. Within the first three years, we've had 30 plus events around the world with nearly 2,000 participants. We have 10,000 supporters from 70 different countries. Even the Director General of the World Health Organization started listening to our recommendations. Just <laughs> thank, thank you, Laura. Uh, these are all really great things. And of course we celebrated our success, um, but the reality is that with that, the perception, the perception actually just was a snowball. We were getting partnerships requests left and right. Uh, and people were imagining we had a Johannesburg office. I would have loved that, so still rooting for the Johannesburg office. <laughs> and it just became really, really overwhelming. Um, so we've slowed down um, in a good way. We've gone back to the basics. We're focusing on organizational building, infrastructure, resources, business planning as they call it. Lesson number two. The individuals by your side at the start of your journey will likely change along the way. It's okay. Don't take it personally. Life happens, priorities change, and most importantly, the space creates opportunities for other people to join, renewed energy, new ideas. Lesson number three, share your struggles, the barriers, the challenges freely. We just don't do it enough. Even with those that are competing um, with your priorities, these honest conversations are truly refreshing. We started doing that in Women in Global Health this year, and it's changed how people treat us. They're kinder, they're patient, they're more understanding, they're coming with resources. So I encourage all of us to really share openly about the struggles. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to go ahead and create solutions together. And don't forget to help those around you. After all, we are stronger together. Lastly, the lioness is strong, but she's strongest with her pride. Thank you.